I, I wanted to start by making a, another announcement, which is that uh, there's a small but important mistake in the way that I wrote homework three, problem number one B, I believe. So that I wrote, I wrote, I was thinking one thing and I wrote another one. I was, I was writing this on the, on the plane on the way here, and I was jet lagged and I wrote the wrong thing. So on the forum there was a small discussion uh, explaining what the problem is, and I rewrote it and I re-uploaded the homework to the website. So you, so make sure that you, that you look at it and you, and you see the change. So try to solve the. Actually, you should also try to solve the other problem. It's a different problem. Uh, it's also an interesting problem, but uh, the one that I meant to put is is on the website. <coughs> okay. So uh, the first thing that I wanted to do today was uh, talk a little bit more about permutations and and different ways of representing them. So, if you remember last time, we represented a permutation by a table, basically by by the permutation matrix. But we just thought of it as a table, and we found that that was very useful for for counting permutations that avoid a particular pattern. Uh, but as you as you will get used to in this class. Uh, in combinatorics, it's, it's very useful to think of the same object in, in several different ways. And so I want to show you a couple of different ways of, of uh, looking at permutations. Uh, and then we'll see some of the, I'll state some of the consequences. So what I wanted to start with today was by showing you two ways that we can represent permutations by trees. So, vector 7. Okay, so the, the first thing that I wanted to do was talk about two tree representations of permutations. The first one is going to go like this. We're going to represent a permutation pi by a tree t of pi by a tree t of pi recursive. So what I'm going to do is whenever we do things recursively we need to start by saying what we need what we do with the kind of smallest permutation, the smallest bonus permutation is the empty permutation and we're going to assign it the empty tree. So that's very boring. And then the, the real key here is what do we do to a permutation that is not trivial? So what we're going to do is that we're going to, we're going to look for the smallest element of the, of the word. I'm going to call it M. And then I'm going to call L the word to the left and R the word to the right, where M is the minimum number. Okay. Now, if this is a if this is a permutation, the number is going to the smallest number is going to be one. If it's a permutation of the numbers from one up to n, but we're actually going to want to use permutations of, of of different lists of numbers that are not necessarily from one up to n. So that's why I call M the minimum instead of just calling it 1. And what you do is that you're simply going to make a tree where you put a node in the top labeled M, and then you put a tree here, which is the tree of L, and a tree here, which is the tree of R. Okay. So are you taking your word and reordering it so that the minimum number is in the center? Is that like do you have to do that deliberately given some? So um, so here I, I have a word in particular. This this is going to apply. This kind of structure is going to apply to any word that has distinct letters, distinct numbers. Okay, and what you do is that you find the smallest number, call it m, and then you call the whatever word you see on the left of M, L, and whatever you see on the right, R. And some of L and R might be empty. Okay? But then you put you know, a node M, and then 
t of l to the left and t of r to the right. Okay. So, for example, what is t of three, six, two, one, seven, eight, four, five? So, yeah. Are we taking the permutation always as this one line notation? Yeah. Sorry. So, so. I should have mentioned that explicitly that, that here I'm thinking of this as one line notation. So I'm thinking of the permutation as a word. So what do I do? I, I look for the smallest guy, which is one. Right? And then here I put t of 362. And here I put t of 7845. Right? But this is recursive, so you just keep repeating this. Okay, so then you say, okay, so so what's this? Uh, here's the one, and now let's do t of three, six, two. So to do that, I'm supposed to look for the smallest number, which is two. Okay. So here's two, and then to the left, I put t of three, six. And to the right, I put t of empty. Right? But t of empty is empty, so that means I don't put anything. Hanging to the right of 2. Okay. Now here, the smallest number is 4. And so I put the 4 here. Then I get t of 7, 8 to its left. And t of 5. So it's right, okay. So then, what do I get? I get here's one. Then I get two over here, four over here. Now here again, you take the smallest is three, and then the six end up ends up hanging to the right of it. So you get a six here, and then here. The smallest is 7, and then 8 hangs to the right of it, and then here, okay? So this is the tree corresponding to this permutation. Okay. So what I get is a bijection with a certain kind of tree, but what kind of tree is this? So between S and and certain kinds of trees that we're gonna call increasing binary trees. Increasing binary trees on N. So okay, well you know it's called a tree because it looks like a tree. So in combinatorics, a tree. It's just a graph that has no cycles, uh, but uh, here, I guess we're not saying it explicitly, but or, or it's not it's not said implicitly, it's not said explicitly in the name, but this tree has a root, okay? And for some reason, we like to draw trees backwards; they they go down instead of going up the way that normal trees do. So here's the root, and then the increasing refers to the fact that the numbers increase as you go down the tree. And the binary means that at every vertex, you have a left kid and or a right kid or right. So labels increase as you go down. Labels increase down the tree. And vertices can have a left and a right subtree. Each vertex may have a left and a right kid. Or neither. Okay. 
but it is important which is which, right? So if if this six was a left kid, that would be a different tree than here where it's a right kid. Okay, so this distinction between left and right is very important here. Okay. Um, why is this a bijection? Well, if I if I give you this, then what do you do? You just look at the root one, and then just put this on the left and this on the right. It's 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 you can do the same the same thing recursively. So it's it's very easy to describe the inverse uh, transformation from the tree to the permutation recursively in the same way. Okay, so it's it's pretty clear from the definition that this is a bijection. Um, and so we get a proposition. There are n factorial binary increasing trees on n. Okay. And as is often the case, again, okay, that means that these things are easy to count, uh, but then we might ask about statistics on them, right? And so you can ask, okay. What are different statistics in the permutation uh, corresponding to in the tree? Okay. And so let me show you an example. So for example, what are the descents correspond to? What are the descents of the word correspond to in the tree? It's not, it's not entirely obvious. I see, I see you going like this. That's the right gesture. <laughs> uh, it, it has something to do with, with uh, having left kids. Um, for example, here's a, here's a descent. How is that descent uh, represented here? What happens is that because this is a descent, that means that as the, as the bijection goes on, who is it going to hit first, two or six? Well, we, we hit things in increasing order. So first, you're going to hit two. Okay? And once you hit two, six is going to be sent to the left of it. That means that the vertex two has a left kid. It corresponds to, I'm going to claim that this corresponds to vertices. of the tree with a left child. So let me say that again. 6-2 was a descent, and that means that once I put 2 in my procedure, 6 is sent to the left of it. Okay. And so that means that 2 is a vertex who has a left kid. The left kid might not be 6, but it has a left kid. Okay. But let's take, look at something that is not a descent. Like uh, one and seven. So, what I claim is that in that case, seven does not have a left kid. And why is that? Because as the as the as the algorithm is run, because one is less than seven, the algorithm is going to hit one before seven. Okay, so it's going to send seven over here, but now seven is going to be the leftmost element of this word. Okay. So that means that it can't have anything to the left of it. So that it means that this guy can't have anything to the left of it. I have a question going back to So how do you know that given an increasing binary tree it corresponds to just one permutation? So the question is how, how do I know that given an increasing binary tree it corresponds to only one permutation? Uh, I, I, I only wave my hands. But, but you would say something like this. You would say, to show that this is a bijection, I need to construct the inverse. And so you would say, OK, what's, what's the inverse construction? Um, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a doing the same thing. You, you would say, what's the inverse of this tree? It should be a word. Okay. Now, I know that m, I mean, I know who the root is, and so I'm going to put down m. 
And then I'm just going to recursively say now, look at the left subtree and, and just apply whatever the image transformation was and figure out what this permutation is. Then figure out what this permutation is and then just go this, this, this to get L and R. And uh, whenever you would see this proof written in a book, it would say it's clear that these maps are, by, are inverse maps. Do you think it's clear? I, I would say that it's clear. Uh, and I would say that if I tried to give a proof, it would be more confusing than not giving a proof, which is often why uh, these things are just left to the reader. Sometimes it's less clear, but I think in this case it is pretty clear that, that these transformations are inverses. Okay, so that means that since descents translate to vertices with left children, that means that we can give a finder result. Uh, which is that, how many of them have left, okay, so, so we, we know how to count permutations by descent, and that means that we know how to count trees by, by this, this statistic. So these are the Eulerian numbers. We, we know that A of NK of these have K vertices with uh, left children. Um, okay. Then again, depending on what you're trying to do with, with your permutation, sometimes this is very useful. Actually, Servando knows this very well because he, I think he uses this very same transformation in his thesis, where he's trying to do something with permutations, and it, it ends up being that the most useful way to do it is to encode it in a tree like this. So, so this is one way of doing this. Okay. Let me show you a different way of doing it. So we're gonna. Now give a second way of representing permutations by trees. Another reason that I'm that I'm doing this, by the way, is that trees are very fundamental objects in combinatorics, and they play a, an important role in a lot of enumerative procedures. So it's good to see how they how they arise in permutations. Okay, two. So we represent a permutation i by a tree, which uh, here I call the t prime of pi, but maybe I should call it something different. By a tree, we call it u of pi. Um, where the parent, okay, so this is a tree, again, on the so permutation pi of n by a tree on n, so again, the vertices are going to be labeled by the numbers from 1 up to n, and uh, the rule is going to be given by what the parent of uh, number i is, and the parent is going to be either j if j is the rightmost number to the left of i, which is smaller than i. So, so you're, you're going to look to the left of i and see who is the first number smaller than i that you see. That's j. But it might be that there is no such number, and in that case, you're going to put a 0. So actually, I lied. The tree is not on n. The tree is on 0 up to n. So it has a special vertex called 0. 0 if there is no such j. And as is often the case, it's useful to just do this for a particular permutation, and then we'll see how this works. So let's do it for the same permutation. And now, 
uh, we're going to compute u of pi. And here the procedures, the rule is different, so the procedure to compute it is going to be a little bit different. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to write down for each i what is the parent of i. So, so what do I do? For each element, I look left and I see what's the first number smaller than it. So here, well, there's nobody to the left of 3. Now, what's, this, what's the first number to the left of 6 smaller than 6? It's 3. The first number here smaller than 2? There are none. The first number to the left of 1 smaller than 1? No. The first number to the left of 7 smaller than 7 is 1. The first one uh, from 8 is 7. From 4, you go until you find 1. And from 5, you go until you find 1. 4. 4. four. Thank you. 5 to 4. And this is going to tell me what the tree is. Um, so, you just say, okay, well, let's start with zero. What are the kids of zero? Well, you can see that they are one, two, and three. Okay. What are the kids of one? Let me make this a little bit bigger. So, zero, the kids are... One, two, and three. What are the kids of one? They are four and seven. Um, what are the kids of two? There are none. The kids of three, six. The kids of four, five. And the kids of seven. Does it matter in the order? It's a very good question. But does it matter what order I wrote these in? Well, actually, this is the reason that I decided to call this tree U because it's this tree is unordered. So that means that I mean I I, I chose to write them one, two, three, but, but the order here doesn't matter. So if I wrote three, six, and then two, that would be the same tree. So before it mattered who was left and who was right. But in this kind of tree, you you don't have a specified order of the kids. They're just Kids. So, an unordered tree like this. Okay. Um, so this is a bijection. Well, first of all, why is this even a tree? In in the previous case, it was obvious from the construction that it, it was a branching construction, so it's obvious that we get a tree. But here, I kind of started drawing it as a tree, and it turned out to be a tree. But why is it a tree? Well, uh, so what did we say? A tree is a graph with no cycles. So how can I justify that there's no cycles here? Actually, a tree is a connected graph with no cycles. If the tree is disconnected, if it has a part over here and a part over here with no cycles, then it's called a forest, because it's a tree and another tree and another tree. But a tree is a connected graph with no cycles. So how do I know that I have no cycles here? Well, there's a very simple reason for that, which is that by the construction, it is clear that the numbers increase as you, as you go down in the way that I drew them. Okay? So you really can draw it in an order um, in such a way that the numbers are increasing down the tree. And so if you had a cycle, you'd have to go down and then up. But the thing is that for each element, I chose its unique uh, path. So, so you can't have a, a guy that has two parents. So that's why I have no cycles. Why, do, why is it a tree? Why is it connected? Because everybody is connected to somebody, right? To their, to their father or whatever, to their parent. For each, for each vertex, I said it's connected to the parent. And uh, as I go up, the, the only guy that doesn't, have, that doesn't have a parent is zero. And as I go up, I am going to hit zero. So that's why this is a tree. Okay. And now what kind of tree is it? So this is a bijection. This is a 
a byte action with, so what are these called? These are called unordered increasing trees. Increasing trees on zero up to n. So the idea is that um, labels increase down the tree. Down the tree. And um, the children of a vertex have no specified order. Right, so what that means is that this tree, 0, 1, 2, is the same as this tree. The order doesn't matter. Okay? So you see they're kind of similar to the other trees, but there's, there's just uh, two differences. One that's more restrictive and one that's less restrictive. So what is more restrictive about this? Uh, what, is, what is less restrictive that you can have uh, you can have several kits for each vertex. Um, but then also that the, the order of left and right doesn't matter. Okay. And uh, it turns out that these trees then are also counted by n factorial. Right? So proposition, they are n factorial unordered unordered increasing trees on Zero up to Okay. And again, we can talk about statistics a little bit. So, well, maybe before we talk about statistics, so what is what is the inverse of this map? Because I'm claiming that there is a bijection, and that means that. Given this tree, you should be able to recover the word. So how do you do that? It's less obvious. Um, and it's more fun. Actually, I don't want to ruin the fun, so I, I, I'm going to let you think about this. How, from this tree, can you figure out what the original permutation was? It's a good exercise. Um, but this is a bijection. So the inverse to describe the inverse is going to be an exercise. We can talk about it on the forum. But again, you can transfer to statistics from permutations to unordered increasing trees. So what kinds of things do we have? Um, For example, what are the descents? So in this case, the descents are here, here. And it's always debatable whether you count the last number as a descent or not. You may or may not choose to count it. Oh, and I, I missed one. This is also a descent. From 6 to 2, from 2 to 1, from 8 to 4, and from 5 to the end. So what do they become? Leaves. At least in this example, it's very clear what they want to be, right? 6, 2, 8, and 5 are the leaves of the tree. Respond to the leaves of the tree. Why is that true? I'll let you think about it. It's a very similar argument to the previous one. Now, let me ask you something else. 
Uh, what are the kids of zero? And the kids of zero are, in this case, one, two, and three. What are these three numbers in the permutation? They're, they're the numbers that, pro that produce a zero here. Right? In other words, they're the numbers that when you look to the left of them, nobody is smaller than them. Right? What do we call that? A number so, so that there's no smaller numbers to the left of it. We had a name for the opposite thing, that the numbers where there were nothing bigger to the left. So we called the, the records. Right? So the, 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 the biggest numbers that you have seen so far. In this case, they are the smallest numbers that you have seen so far. So you start here, and 3 is the smallest number that you've seen so far, so you get a 0. Then when you hit the 2 again, there's nobody to the left of it. There's no worse score to the left of it, so you put a zero here, and so on. And so th these are what are, we might call the anti-records, like the, the worst scores that we've seen so far. Anti-records of pi correspond to the children of the roots. This is this is again almost by definition of the of the bijection. So what that means, what these two results mean is that we have, again, two enumerative results about unordered increasing trees. This one is about Eulerian numbers, as we, as we just said. A, N of K of them have what? Um, this corresponds to the leaves, K leaves. You want to count trees by, by the number of leaves, you get the Eulerian numbers. What if you count them by, by the number of children of the root? So have a root with k children. How many permutations are there with k anti records? Well, if, you, if you just. Uh, it's clear how to switch records to anti records. If all of a sudden what you value is the lowest possible score instead of the highest possible score, then empty records become records. So that the number of permutations with k empty records is going to be the same as the number of permutations with k records. And those were given by those Sterling numbers. That's what that's when, when we discussed uh, records, we discussed them in the context of these Sterling numbers. C of n k them have a root with k children. Okay. And so you see again in the in the context of enumerating these these uh, these trees like this, uh, again these numbers, Eulerian numbers and Sterling numbers come out very naturally um, in the enumeration. Any questions about that? Yeah. I have a random question. I know that you can like traverse trees in certain ways. And like if you were to traverse this tree, like starting from the root node and going along the left branch and then up and then along the seven eight and then up to the two and then the three six or on one side of it. You like you can go on the left side or on the right side. And those would probably give you different permutations. So I was just wondering if they have like any relationship or anything. So Krista's suggesting that we could try to walk around this tree. Imagine if you're, I don't know, if you're a little squirrel that's kind of climbing, going down the tree like this, and then it goes around. Around like that. 
What does that have, what does that have to do with what we're talking about here? Krista has the feeling that this has to do with what we're doing. The, the nodes that the squirrel encounters are exactly in this order. Three, six, two, one, seven, eight, four, five. You see why I didn't want to give it away? Uh, why? What if I what if I switch? The, the, right. So it's very important, and I did it on purpose. You can always draw it in such a way that the kids increase in age, let's say. You can always choose to draw the tree with the, uh, the kids in increasing order. And I need to do that for this bijection to work. So if I had drawn these two switched, then I would have had the wrong permutation. And so what, what Krista is suggesting is that the right bijection, u inverse is to draw the tree, rearrange the kids of each uh, parent if necessary so that the kids go in increasing age, let's say, and just walk around that tree. And the labels that you increase are going to give you the permutation. So, can we say, obviously, this is the inverse? No. This is, this is very obviously not obvious. <laughs> right? And this, is, this is something where the map U and the map U inverse sound quite different from each other, and you are going to have to prove that they are inverses. Okay. So does it matter? Sorry. So the, the, the question was, that's what I'm just saying, well, I, I thought order didn't matter. The thing is that, again, these two trees are considered to be this, the same tree, okay? And each tree has a, has a unique way of being drawn so that, I mean, it's like you draw, like you draw uh, family trees, right? You, people always draw family trees so that the kids, are, the siblings are in, are in, in uh, I guess in that case, the oldest are first, is what's usually traditional. But that's what we're doing. We're just drawing this family tree style where for each parent, the, their kids are listed in increasing order. And I could choose to list them in a different order. Those are different drawings of the same tree. But each tree has a unique way of being drawn like that. Okay. Uh, I'm budgeting my time here. and. There was one thing that I wanted to tell you about, but I think I'm not going to have time, and I think that's okay, because it was, it was meant to be something fun, interesting, but not entirely central to what we're talking about. So I would suggest that even though I'm not going to do it, you should have a look at uh, page 35 in my notes. It's the page that we didn't discuss. It's about... A, B index, and C, D index. And uh, it's just an example of a really beautiful, intriguing result about permutations that is, is very kind of, it's kind of magical looking in the language of permutations. And to understand it, you are much better off switching to the language of trees. Again, so very often a different point of view uh, can help you understand something better. And so instead of using the language of permutations, for that particular result, it's useful to use the language of trees. Uh, so have a look, read it, and if you like it, it's part of a very large, interesting story that has to do with uh, polytopes, posets, and things like this. And we will, say mo so we'll, we will say something about it later on in class, but maybe for now, I won't. The reason I want is that I want to talk about something that is more important to the main things that we're doing, and this is to talk about Q binomial coefficients. Q analog of binomial coefficients. So let me remind you that we talked about Q analogs already. So 
So the Q analog of the number n is the polynomial 1 plus Q plus Q squared up to Q to the n minus 1. Then we said that the Q analog of n factorial was multiplying. And let, let me quickly say that I'll do this and immediately I'm going to drop the subscript Q because Q is always going to be the same thing here. And so I'm just going to drop the subscript and just write it like this. So there are there are cues underneath each one of these things, but it's easier to read like this. And uh, then let me now define the Q analog of n choose k, which uh, I don't think I defined this, did I? But what do you think it is? The obvious, the obvious thing, just replace factorials with Q factorials, and then so this is going to be the Q binomial coefficient, and then I could also push this to be a Q multinomial coefficient. And this is just going to be the same thing, a factorial over. One factorial dot 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 up to a n factorial where here it's important that a one plus two n. Okay. So this is the Q binomial coefficient and the Q multinomial coefficient. Actually, uh, does somebody have a way of, of uh, doing some computer algebra in front of you right now? Can you help me compute something? Anybody have your computer? I want to think about what this is, for example. Just to make this nice and concrete. So I choose two, but the, but the Q by normal version. Okay, so what is this? It's phi factorial. I wonder if maybe we can do it without. Maybe this is small enough that we can just do it. We'll see. Three factorial, two factorial. Okay. So what is this? This is uh, well, five factorial divided by three factorial is just five times four in in Q version, right? So five times four over two factorial, which is two times one. By the way, if you if you change the square brackets to parentheses, this is just binomials, right? And there is this magical thing with binomial coefficients that here things cancel and you always get an integer. Okay, so what do we get here? We get one plus dot 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 up to q to the fourth, one plus dot 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 until q to the three over one plus q. Okay? So is this a polynomial or is it a fraction? Well, what is 1 plus q plus q squared plus q cubed? Actually, this is a multiple of this. And the fraction is, well, so I'll just be writing this one, and then this divided by this is just 1 plus q squared. Um, it's a polynomial, and it's slightly magical that it's a polynomial. Now, again, when you when you do binomial coefficients, n choose k is a big product of numbers over a big product of numbers. Why is that an integer? If you say it in this way, it's kind of magical, because you need to make sure that the you know the number of times that a prime appears in the denominator should be. Uh, 
less than or equal to the number of times that it appears in the numerator. If it's going to be an integer for any prime. And there is a kind of a number, there's a cute number theoretic proof that these numbers are integers by counting prime divisors in the bottom and in the top. Okay? But here it's harder because we're talking about polynomials. And, and yet, it is the case, I mean, it's even less likely that if you write a big mess of things like this, you're going to get a polynomial. But the fact is that we always do get a polynomial. And uh, so we want to explain that. So I'm going to give you a minute to think about how you might explain that. And think about how, what's an easier way of explaining that binomial coefficients are integers. And let's try to see if we can give a similar explanation here. While I let you think about that, let me write down a property that is very easy. That is inherited. Which is that multinomial coefficients are given in terms of binomial coefficients. Okay. This is true for Binomial coefficients is also true for Q binomial coefficients, and the proof is very straightforward. So any ideas as to how we might show that these guys are polynomials? Again, you should, you should think that the reason that things are called Q analogs is that they share many of the properties of what they are a Q analog of. So what, kind of, what properties do binomial coefficients have that we might try to make these guys inherit? So one would be counting something. If we can get them to count something polynomial, great. We'll do that, but it's a little bit harder. There's an easier way, kind of a cheaper way. Um, just like there is a cheap way of proving that binomial coefficients are integers, which is to use Pascal's triangle. Because Pascal's triangle obviously produces integers, and so if you because you know it's it's an additive thing, and so. The, the, rec the recurrent formula for n choose k gives you that they're integers, and so what we could try to do is find a similar recurrence. Okay? And so that recurrence, well, you, we know what it should look like. n choose k should be equal to n choose k minus 1 plus, sorry, n minus 1 choose k. So this is this is the, the the relation for Pascal's triangle. So we might hope that the same relation holds. Well, actually, that can't really be because the Qs need to appear somewhere, right? And if, if the recurrence was this, then there would be no Qs. So it turns out that, and again, it's very often the case that similar but slightly different things hold, and in this case. It's this that holds. Okay. How do you prove it? This is very, very straightforward. You can just plug in the formula, and you'll get that. You'll get that. Okay. And this does give you that they're that they're polynomials. Just because you can you can now make a Pascal's triangle of these guys, and you get ones out ones on the sides, but the recurrence now produces factors of Q, and that means that you're going to get just factors of Q. You're going to get polynomials. So consequence, so nk is a function of q is polynomial. Something that's very unclear from that definition is very clear from this one. So now I'm going to follow, uh, well, Maybe before saying that, let me say that it's polynomial in Q and it has positive coefficients. And again, this is this is not at all clear. You you know you when you have fractions like this, even if the fractions have positive coefficients, you can create negative coefficients, right? Like if you had one plus Q cubed over one plus Q, what's that? That's one minus Q plus Q squared. 
squared. So it could be that it's a polynomial with negative coefficients, but here we see that it has positive coefficients. With positive coefficients. And that gives more hope to Kyla's idea that we might be able to count something. So that's what we're going to do. Okay. So. going to be our, our next theorem. Proposition. Let's let M be a set having A11s, A22s, up to Now, by the way, let me ask you, do you remember how, how this number appeared? How this thing appeared? 1, 1 plus q, 1 plus q plus q squared, 1 plus q plus q squared plus q cubed, etc. If you, if you go back to your notes, you will see that this appeared when we were trying to enumerate permutations according to their inversions. And we saw that the sum Of let me let me write something that is not the conclusion of this theorem so you remember it. This is this is where Q factorials appear, and what I'm gonna show is that this is the permutations of n different things, but now we're permuting things that might have repetitions. And we're going to show that when you permute an element, permute a set with repetitions, then you get multinomial coefficients instead of factorial. And uh, the other case is a special case of this one, because when we when we permute the numbers from one up to n, that means that all the ai's are equal to one, and so you get n choose one 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 one, which is just n factorial. So this is the statement, and uh, give you a proof. Consider this bijection. That takes permutations. By the way, I didn't write it, but I hope it's clear what this means. This is, these are the permutations of this multiset. So it has repetitions. And so what I'm going to do is that I'm going to consider a bijection that goes like this. And this bijection does have, does have hope of working because um, remember how many permutations that we say this guy has? Well, it, it actually, we talked about this also, it's just the, the binomial coefficient, the multinomial coefficient, n choose a1, a2, etc. So the size of this is n factorial divided by a1 factorial, a2 factorial, a n factorial. This bijection, I'm just going to do an example, and I think that'll be clearer than trying to write it in some kind of notation. So 1, 3, 2, 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, 2, okay? And now, so that's the permutation of M. It has repetitions. And then I have A1 once. So I need a permutation of the ones. So it's going to be 3, 1, 2. Then I need a permutation of size A2. I have four twos, and so I need a permutation of the numbers from one up to four. Let me use one, three, two, four. And then, does anybody happen to have a red marker in their bags? 
So now, S sub A3, so I have uh, two threes, so I need a permutation of the number from one up to two, so let me use two comma one. Okay. What is this permutation going to do? I need a permutation of the numbers from one up to nine, which is the length one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna consider that the ones are tied and I'm going to use these numbers to break the tie between the ones. The twos are tied, and I'm going to use this to break the tie between the twos. The threes are tied, so I use this to break the tie. So I say, okay, the, the ones are tied. And so in, instead of them, I put three, one, and two. Now the twos are tied. Make this a little bit darker. Three, one, two. The twos are tied, so I break them in this order. Okay. So, but what are the next numbers? That's for one, two, and three. Go four, five, six, and seven. And so I put down four, five, six, and seven in this order. So I put first the four. And the 5 is this one, so I put the 5 here. Then the 6 is this one. And then the 7 is this one. So I put the numbers 4, 5, 6, 7 in this order. And then finally I put down 8 and 9 in this order. So the 9 goes first and the 8 goes second. And that gives me a permutation of the number from 1 up to 9. And actually, the inverse is very clear if you know how many 3s, so how many 1s, how many 2s, and how many 3s are. Then to get back this one, you just put these guys to be 1, these guys to be 2, and these guys to be 3. And then to get these permutations back, you just, you just kind of put these numbers in, in this order. It's very clear that this is a bijection. Now, the thing is that this bijection has the property that it's additive with respect to inversions. So if I call this pi 0 and this pi 1, pi 2 up to pi n, that's going to give me the number of inversions of Okay, the number of inversions in this permutation is just the inversions here plus the inversions here plus the inversions here plus the inversions here. How do I see that? It's actually quite easy also. Because let's look at an inversion of this permutation. Let's say from here to here. I'm claiming that I also have, a have an in inversion in this permutation. Why is that? Because 3 is bigger than 2. And the numbers that I use in red, which are the threes, are bigger than the numbers that I use in the twos, which are the greens. So if this is bigger than this, then I use a bigger number for this one than for this one. So inversions here become inversions here. OK, now, why does a blue inversion, but maybe blue, blue is too easy. What about a green inversion like this one? This inversion also gives me an inversion here, right? Because these numbers are in the same order as these numbers. And so that's why every, any inversion in each one of these places gives me an inversion in one of these places, and it's easy to see that there are no other ones. Okay. Um, and so then what do you do? You basically get the proof.
because then we get that the sum over the pi in Sn So as in this is on the right hand side. Now let's apply the bijection and send it to the transfer it to the summation. So each permutation in Sn is going to correspond to a permutation in Sm, a permutation in S of A1, up to a permutation in S of A. I have a projection between these and these. Now, if I want to express this in terms of all of these guys, well, I know that the inversions of pi are given by this. Okay. Now, this is a, a summation of m plus one things, but actually, I can also write this multiplicatively as this times this times like that, right? Which means that I can actually factor this into sum pi zero and S n q to the inversions of pi zero. And I shouldn't be using square brackets in this proof because they mean something. So I get this times, then I take out the term corresponding to SA1, Q to the inversions of I1, etc. Okay. Now, the thing is that we already know how, what this is. Right? This is just n factorial. What about this? Well, this is what we're trying to compute. And then this, again, these are just the permutations of size A1, and so this is given by A1 factorial, then this is given by A2 factorial, etc., up to AM factorial, which gives me that what I'm trying to compute is N factorial divided by the AIs with factorials. Okay? Just this. Questions about that? And so, again, this, this goes back to this commentary that I, was, uh, that I was making earlier in the semester, where I told you that if there's one important thing that I want you to get out of this class is that whenever you're doing something that's related to combinatorics, and whenever positive integers come up, what combinatorialists like to do is to find combinatorial interpretations for them. And I hope that you get this instinct when you're done with this class. If you're doing combinatorics, you get a sequence of positive integers, they should count something, hopefully. And so this is what we're doing here, right? We're saying this number, sorry, this, this polynomial, it's, it's a polynomial, right? It's a polynomial in Q. It has coefficients that are positive integers. And so if the coefficient of Q to the 7 is 24, I want to know, okay, 24 what? 24 cats, 24 dogs, 24 permutations such that what? And, he, and this is the answer, right? 24 permutations of this multiset, which have seven inversions. And so this gives me a combinatorial interpretation for the coefficients of the multinomial, of the Q multinomial coefficient. Um, cool. So, What we're going to see next time is that this isn't just kind of a, a exercise in combinatorics only. We're, I want to show you that these uh, multinomial coefficients, aside from appearing very naturally as counting inversions and multisets, they also have very natural interpretations coming from uh, geometry and linear algebra. So we're going to start next time by, by discussing that and seeing. 
and I, I made a brief reference to this in the in the forum already, but, I, but we're, we're going to be proving some things about how these things appear when we're doing linear algebra over finite fields. I think my time is basically up, so let's uh, let's stop here. Do I have five more minutes? Yeah, three more minutes. Let me state the result then. I, I, I keep forgetting what time this class is supposed to end. I have three more minutes. And in three more minutes, I want to state this beautiful theory. And we're, and we're going to prove it next time. So the, the theorem is the following. Let Q be some prime power. There's some positive in integer. Okay. The reason that I take this guy is that you might remember from your abstract algebra class, if you have taken it, that there is a field of Q elements. And uh, if you want to make this a little bit more concrete, you can just think that Q is a prime, and this is just Z mod P, right? So we're just looking at things modulo the prime P. Okay? Now let's look at the, the vector space at Q to the N. What are the, what's a vector in that vector space? Yeah, it's given by n coordinates, and each coordinate is a number, is, is, is an element of the field. How many elements are there? Well, you, for each coordinate, you choose an element of the field, so there's q possibilities for each coordinate. So that means q times q times q, you have q to the n points. Uh, so it's a finite vector space, which you might not be used to, but it's a vector space that has q to the n Elements. Okay. So then, how many? Let's talk about subspaces. Okay. So what's a subspace? Well, given that it's a finite set of points, a subspace is also just some finite thing. So a k subspace is some k subspace of this finite thing. There's going to be finitely many possibilities, and we can count. Them. And. Turns out that the number of vector spaces of subspaces is exactly this. If you haven't seen this before, I, I, I think you should. Be, I hope you're very excited about this. This is a really nice result. It's very simple, uh, and it shows you why, you know, a set of n elements has n choose k k subsets. And here, what we're saying is that the Q analog of that is that sets become now finite vector spaces. Subsets become subspaces, and n choose k becomes n choose k. So, yeah, so this is why I tell you that th this number just couldn't be more natural in, in linear algebra over a finite vector space, or uh, over a finite field. So, yeah, so ne next time we'll start by proving this theorem and then talk about some concepts.